May I now request Dr. Vandana Shiva to deliver the oration. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Vandana Shiva. Thank you very much, Father Christie, for that very warm introduction. Thank you, Dr. Madhukar Shukla, for initiating the, this series of orations dedicated to the memory of an amazing man who's left an amazing legacy, especially for our times. It's an honor for me to give the Virgis Korean oration, and uh, Nirmala, it's a joy to meet you. I had. I had gone to Anand to the Institute of Rural Development to do a talk and I got this message in the guest house. I was there a few hours before my talk uh, that Dr. Kurian wanted to meet me. And then he spent about three hours talking about the country, the challenges we face, and uh, nothing about himself but the dedication and love for addressing the biggest problems our country faces. And he addressed those problems successfully. It's a legacy he has left for us. It's a legacy we need to build on. For him, the 1.6 crore members of the cooperative movement were the heart and soul of what he was building. This is very different from the economy of the 1% that we have today. And it's very different from the planet that this economy is creating. The figures shocked me so much that I decided to write a book. My latest book is called Oneness Versus the 1%. Because in 2010, there were 388 billionaires who controlled as much wealth as the bottom half of humanity, which is already too much. This number dwindled to 177 in 2011, to 150 in 2012, to 92 in 2013, to 80 in 2014, to 62 in 2015, shriveling to a mere eight in 2016 and five in 2017. In 2018, the billionaires increased their wealth by 900 billion. That's 2.5 billion a day. This level of polarization of the economy isn't just an economic polarization. It has divided humanity along many fractures. The 1% economy is a glaring and brutal expression of economic inequality, but it is not just a system of economic inequality, it also has implications for the planet, for society, for democracy. Economic polarization contributes to social and political polarization. It has intended and unintended consequences for social cohesion, political democracy, and ecological sustainability. The 1% symbolizes a system of thought and an intellectual paradigm. It's based on a worldview of separation and extermination of the other. Separation of humans from nature, therefore treating nature as disposable. Of humans from humans, therefore dividing us along lines of hate. Fragmentation and dismemberment of ecosystems and of communities through artificially constructed walls of the mind. It is based on reducing everything to commodity to be bought and sold for profit, but even more to remove every limiting 
system which is called regulation. They could be ethical regulation. They could be ecological and environmental regulation. They could be regulations based on the rights of farmers, the rights of workers, the rights of women, the rights of children. These are the regulatory systems that keep a system operating within limits of sustainability and justice. And it's the deregulation of the last 20 years that has allowed the emergence of the 1% economy. The 1% economy is a 1% economy not just in terms of the small number that it symbolizes, but as so much of my own work in agriculture shows, it's a 1% economy in the sense that it leaves 1% for the remaining 99%. And so no wonder India has dropped to levels of hunger and malnutrition that are worse than the Great Bengal Famine. Every fourth Indian hungry, is hungry today. Every second Indian child is wasted and stunted. We've lost 320, 32,000 farmers to suicide because of a debt trap. And after 2016, the solution became don't take the count anymore. So the nutrition data doesn't get counted and the farmer suicide data doesn't make, get made public. And I call it the don't look, don't see policy. You, know? you don't look and then you can say it doesn't exist. Because measuring is such an important point of evidence. Now, my thesis, as Father mentioned, my PhD thesis was in quantum theory. And even in physics, through quantum theory, we've realized that the mechanical idea of separation is very artificial. The world does not work through separation. The world is interconnected. And in interconnected systems, mutuality, cooperation, synergy, symbiosis, these are the processes, both in the natural world as well as in the social world. This is what keeps systems going. And I think Dr. Kurian's contribution was because when he built the cooperative model of the economy, he realized that cooperation was the organizing principle to create more wealth and more distributed wealth throughout the system. Rather than first a pyramid of extraction that takes everything to the top, but then makes the top so heavy that it becomes an inverted pyramid that can topple any moment ecologically, it can topple any moment politically, and it can topple any moment socially. That's the kind of fragility of our moment we are living in. All the international agencies that have been set up to look at what's happening to the planet, most of them were created when we were working on, uh, on the Earth Summit in Rio in 92. Before that, a commission had been created called the Brundtland Commission and um, Grohal and Brundtland was asked to think of our common future. What would it look like? And it's that commission that led to the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in 92. Then we had a 10 year after Rio in Johannesburg and uh, and I remember that's around the time when I was nominated, when our Time magazine called me an environmental hero. And my favorite company, Monsanto, got so mad, they, they sent to a press conference I was holding in Johannesburg. A, a man came with, with two lumps of cow dung. And I said, oh, an organic farmer has brought me cow dung. And in a way, cow dung is the relationship between Dr. Kurian's work and my work. He worked on cows, and I work with the soil that the cows fertilize. I work on agriculture. Anyway, so I thought it was an organic farmer bringing me cow dung in appreciation of what I'd done. 
and it was actually a lobbyist of Monsanto. He said, no, it's the bullshit award for making the world starve with organic. I received it and I said, thank you so much. You can call it bullshit, it's still cow dung. It will still make good compost. And we had outside the hall a major composting ceremony with this bullshit award. Well, then we had 20 years after Rio, again in Rio. The two major treaties that are legally binding, that are regulatory frameworks for the world, are the UN Framework of Conven Convention on Climate Change, UNFCC, and the Convention on Biological Diversity. I used to work on both. I used to work to advise our government, I used to work with our ministers. And interestingly, our minister's speech at Rio for the climate treaty was based on the fact that we were a renewable energy economy based on both renewable bioenergy as well as renewable animal energy. 80% of our energy came from there. So we could negotiate very strongly because most of the carbon dioxide coming from fossil fuel usage was coming from the industrialized world. And therefore, we created a very strong treaty for accountability and responsibility. That is what has got unraveled after the Copenhagen summit. Something was put together in Paris. And right now, President Trump has said he won't even listen to that. But you saw yesterday the millions of children who are out on the streets all over the world. Those children are reading these reports that the leaders aren't. They're reading every page of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change document. And this year's IPCC report is so connected to the work I do because I realized that when people talked of climate change, they thought it was only about finding other sources of energy. And all the data in IPCC was showing that when I did the book Soil Not Oil, it was 40 to 45 percent. Today it's 50 to 55 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions come from a fossil fuel based, chemical based farming system. Directly for the fossil fuel use, but for every kilogram of urea manufacture, there's a liter of diesel. And Artificial fertilizers like urea emit a greenhouse gas, nitrous oxide, which is 300 times more destabilizing for the environment. And it's not just destroying the atmosphere with the emissions, the runoff, only 10% of the nitrogen is taken up by plants. The rest of it is running off into water bodies. You're getting algae blooms, you're getting dead zones. So the water bodies are dying, the atmosphere is getting destabilized, and my book on the Green Revolution that I wrote after the violence of Punjab, I wrote it for the United Nations University, we realized that to do chemical farming, you use 10 times more water to grow the same amount of food. Because now you've killed the soil organisms, you've killed the water holding capacity of soil, you need to constantly irrigate. The chemicals themselves require a lot of water. For growing the same amount of wheat, 10 times more water, which is why Punjab, the land of five rivers, is today a danger zone in water. On surface water, they're having conflicts, but the groundwater is going. Every second day, I think the Niti Aayog is constantly talking about the water crisis we face. I do not see ever the issue of land use and agriculture addressed in it. But 90% of our water, the purest groundwater, is being used to dissolve chemicals that we don't need in farming. And on the other hand, when you do organic farming, our figures are showing that with 0.5% organic matter, you can hold 80,000 liters of water in soil. 
the soil itself becomes a water reservoir. And for the students, you're very young, you won't know an India pre-Green Revolution, but those of us who are pre-Green Revolution know an India where whether it was the Kharif season, which is the monsoon season, or the Rabi season, the entire land used to be covered with crops. Even in the non-monsoon non season, you grew crops everywhere because you were while working the soil to ensure, ensure that it has moisture. And throughout India's history, 75% of the land has been rain fed. And the fact that it's been rain fed is the synergy between the crops and the livestock. So the drier the land, the higher the density of animals. The wetter the land, the lower the density of animals. If you go towards Gujarat and you go towards uh, Rajasthan, there's much more density because the animals have to recycle your organic matter. It's too dry for the moisture to create the decomp decomposition. On our farm, you know, over time I've built a biodiversity conservation farm and I hope some of you will visit. I hope the students of XLRI will be able to come and learn. I say, you know, at the Navdanya farm, nature is the first teacher. The pollinators are your teachers. The earthworms and the mycorrhizae are your teachers. The peasants who work are your teachers. And you yourself, when your mind is open, are a teacher. For me, my ecological work has been an amazing learning in cooperation. So the mechanistic worldview that quantum theory overthrew says that everything is separate. Everything is fragmented. Nothing can change. Quantum theory we know everything is related. My thesis was on non-locality and non-separability in quantum theory. But everything is changeable. And what you find depends on what you measure. So you find a particle if you measure the particle, and you find a wave when you measure the wave, because it can be both. That's the beauty of quantum theory. It allows us to see the world as a wave or a particle. And this idea of potential I think is so important in our times because we can either see ourselves as having the potential for hate and unleashing that negative energy in society or having the potential to care and to love and unleashing that in society. And each of us is being called to reflect on our potentials. So when I started saving seeds, I was only saving seeds. And I called it Navdanya. And it's a peasant who, a tribal peasant who taught me the significance of the word Navdanya, the link between the nine planets, the earth, and our health. And diversity is this interconnection, and co harmony is the connection. But how do you get harmony? Harmony doesn't come between two separate entities. Harmony comes through the right relationship of interaction. And that's cooperation. That's what Dr. Kurian put his pulse on to build the amazing system that he has left us. The, the extractive economy of the 1% is very good at taking. And it's very good at taking what doesn't belong to them. I mean, you know, we are right now in eastern India, not too far from you, is Bengal. That's where out of the blue, Clive came. There was a battle of Plassey. And before you know it, the land of this country belonged to the East India Company. And a system was created called Lagan. If you look at the history, the tribal history, whether it's the Birsa Mundas or whoever, or you look at the peasant histories, they were all movements against Lagan. Even the 1857 
movement that began in Meerut was against the agrarian crisis of that time. And I did a, a pilgrimage for the Champaran uh, centenary in 2017 because Gandhi had come to Champaran in 1917 to support the peasants in this fight against compulsory cultivation of indigo. That was his first Satyagraha in India. His first Satyagraha in Africa was against compulsory registration on the basis of race, the apartheid regime. And of course, the sole Satyagraha was the really big Satyagraha. But when I went to Meerut, and I was honoring the descendants, all of whom had lost their lands, their grandparents had been killed, these young people now are all landless workers. They're breaking stones on roads. But we found them, we honored them. And then I went to the memorial where the names of the people who had been killed in the 1857, I call it the first movement of independence. In the history books, it's called the Sepoy Mutiny. Half the names were Muslim, half the names were Hindu. And that's when the East India Company had to close up, they had to wrap up, and in their place, the British Crown took over. <coughs> First policy that was put in place to continue to rule India was divide and rule. So from 1857 onwards, this construction of an artificial division between Hindus and Muslims was done. And when they tried the census in the early days, it was fascinating when, they, when they'd ask, what's your religion? Many people would put Hindu Muslim because they'd go to a Sufi shrine. Or what's your first identity, Mali? Because religion was a secondary and third level. Your livelihood was your first identity. So we are still living through the remains of this divide and rule policy. And I won't address it today, but it's in my book, Oneness Versus the One Percent, how the one percent actually finances the divide and rule of today. You know, we think, we see individual leaders, but as a physicist, I've been, my mind has been trained to understand process and understand patterns. And a common pattern I see around the world is the same kind of language, the same kind of rhetoric, the same hate, the same division. And all I'll leave you with is an indicator. If you look at the top 10 billionaires, who are actually now trillionaires, by and large, most of them have created a new empire. If the empire of the British was taking over our land, the new empire, the new colony of our times, is our minds and our behavior. How does this work? A Facebook exchange between you and your friends gives indications of your behaviors. This is mind. This minding is then manipulated through a whole new discipline of behavioral modification. Algorithms are put to work to pick certain elements, most of it for consumerism. You know, if you happen to talk about a blue shirt before you know it, out of your computer pops an ad for a blue shirt. If you went to a party and complimented someone on their dress, that dress is advertised to you the next time. But the more dangerous part of it is what was witnessed with Facebook selling personal data of people to Cambridge Analytica and Cambridge Analytica organizing this data in England and in the United States on the basis of hate. Hate against women, hate against blacks, hate against Muslims and hate against migrants. That's where Brexit was born. And in fact, there was an article that said that we could actually think of the current president of the United States as the first artificial intelligence president of the world. Elected not by people, but by these algorithms. 
So the 1% carves new colonies, makes you pay for what's yours, takes away your integrity. My life's work, ever since I found out they wanted to make a new colony in the seed, by declaring the seed as intellectual property. I said, but Monsanto, you don't invent a seed. This is creation. You might modify it, but modification is not creation. It's like my coming to XLRI and saying, I brought my bag here. So Father Christie, since I brought one bag, like Monsanto brings one gene, I built this auditorium, I built the campus, and now, not only will your students, but you will pay me a lagan. That is intellectual property rights on seed. And this is what I've dedicated my whole life to fighting. I said, no, seed is not a machine, it's not an invention, it's not a manufacture. It's the continuity of evolution in its highest creation. And it has been evolved by farmers in their brilliance. Our peasant farmers, our tribal farmers of this belt, you know, Orissa, this part of Chhattisgarh, this belt has given the world the richest diversity of rice, the Indica varieties, 200,000 varieties. Just imagine the brilliance to take one grass and convert it into 200,000 varieties of rices. That is farmers breeding. And that's the breeding we in Navdanya have conserved. And this conservation is not just important because it's our legacy, but it's so important in these times of climate change. So we have a, a seed bank in Orissa, in Balasore. When the 2000 cyclone came, it was 99 maybe, we had saved seeds. And there were salt tolerant seeds which we could immediately distribute to the farmers and they could revive their agriculture. Then the farmers of Orissa took two truckloads of salt tolerant seeds down to Tamil Nadu at the time of the tsunami because the tsunami like the cyclone brings salt on the land. We've got salt tolerant, flood tolerant seeds, we've got drought tolerant seeds, we've got seeds of so much aroma. We found one of the collections of rice in Chhattisgarh. Scientists have now found it has anti-cancer properties. You know, here we are. I mean, I watch when I travel, I, I can't believe my eyes because every time I travel, India is a little more howdy. Yeah? For those of you who don't understand, that's the greeting in America. Hum kehte hai namaskar. Maa kehte hai howdy. The junk of America is being eaten by our people. The worst junk which is now known to be responsible for 75% of the chronic diseases that humanity suffers from. The cancers, 5% are genetic. The rest are induced by the environmental damage and the food we eat. Endocrine disruption. The entire metabolic dis, uh, uh, imbalance that r comes out as diabetes. And of course, everyone's getting a two rupee rice, but it's a white polished rice with no dal, with no oil, with no greens, no fiber. High rates of diabetes among the poor in India. And when it goes undiagnosed, what's happening? We are not even keeping the data on the kidney failures. People are dying. People are dying in this country because of the imbalance in our diet. And for those who can afford it, because our minds have been colonized, they're living on a diet of burgers. You know, chow mein is our national dish, or Nestle's noodles. Now, I was just thinking, Nestle is the biggest dairy company of the world. And when the figure of 1.5 crore farmers was given, I was looking at Nestle ha uh, takes supply for the whole world, 600,000, 6 lakh farmers. Look at how much bigger our dairy is and how much more it benefits. 
we've managed to destroy our agriculture by breaking the symbiosis between humans and the soil, by breaking the symbiosis between animals and plants. So in our seed work, we found that our varieties are all multi-purpose varieties. We have tall varieties where we eat the grain and the straw is eaten by the animals, or the straw goes back as compost, or when in Orissa I used to travel earlier, people still have thatch. And I would ask, well, why do you still grow your old rice? And they'd say it's the only one whose straw makes a good thatch. The new dwarf varieties make a leaky thatch. The new dwarf varieties, the straw can't be eaten, which is why the poor farmers of Punjab burn their straw. It's part of the plant that has now been made useless. But to make a dwarf variety, you've converted what were biodiverse mixed systems into monocultures of dwarfs, pumped with chemical, pumped with water, emitting huge amounts of greenhouse gases, desertifying the soil, and creating nutritionally empty grain. We've never had gluten allergies in this country, never. Imported wheat and the new breeding of wheat is allowing higher expression of gluten. I fought a case against Monsanto that had pirated and patented an old wheat variety of India. We've had to fight the neem. You know, the WR Grace said we've invented. Grace and the US government said we've invented the neem. I said, my poor grandmother used it, my mother used it. We started a campaign after Bhopal. No more Bhopals, let's plant a neem. And now 10 years later, they say they invented our grandmother's knowledge. I fought that case 11 years in the European Patent Office. And even though in the first round when they lost, they appealed. In the second round, it was International Women's Day. I think in 2005, 11 years later, when the judge said, come back after lunch and we'll give you the decision. And we said, you know, these companies have so much power to corrupt. Maybe they'll overturn. The judge gave one line judge decision. He said, happy Women's Day. You won. How did we take up the biggest superpower of the world and one of the biggest companies of the world? Trust and cooperation. That's all we had. We had no money to fight a case in Europe, to stick with the case for 11 years. Another case of Basmati, you know, I come from Dehradun, Dehraduni Basmati is so famous. Company in Texas added tech. These days all you do is tech, ag tech, rice tech. Things become tech and suddenly it's an invention of the pirate. Basically, rice tech took a basmati and crossed it with another variety, but they took a patent on the aroma of our basmati, on the height of the plant, on the length of the grain. And we fought that case too. We monitored more than 1,500 cases of climate resilient patents based on piracy. Because when you, when you colonize someone else, part of what you have to engage in is piracy. Because you're taking over either the knowledge or the biodiversity of the other people. Now this is precisely the time sovereignty over our biodiversity and our knowledge becomes vital. Our work has shown that by, intensif by intensifying biodiversity, we actually grow more food. Because in a field of biodiversity, you have cooperation working. Cooperation between different species. Let me give you just two examples. So when we spray pesticides, we don't think. But we are destroying not just other species, the data is that 80% of all insect species have disappeared in the last 20, 30 years because of pesticide use. Among them are the butterflies, bees, and pollinators. Our research on the farm has shown that one third of the production of food comes from the pollinators. We did a scientifically controlled experiment. 
One third, every third spoonful you eat comes from pollinators. No one's done the work on how much the soil organisms give you, but Howard, who was sent to India in 1905 to improve Indian agriculture, came and found in Bihar, in Pusa, the soil's fertile, the, no pest damage to the f f crops, and he said, I must learn farming from the peasants of India. I'll make them my professor. He wrote a book called The Agricultural Testament. This is the reason we have a contemporary organic movement. So there are people who, are, who these days, including Monsanto, they attack organic. And I always have to respond, but organic is not an import. Organic is desi gone worldwide. It has spread from this land. And the two principles that Howard identified in his work are the principles, he called it the law of return. I would identify it as Dr. Kurian's principle of cooperation. Because what do you do when you return? When, I, when the earth gives me organic matter and I give back part of it to the soil, I'm creating a circular economy of nutrition. This is the circular economy that is the future. Of course, these days, there's an assumption that the circular economy is global creation of waste then global recycling in one plant of all the plastic of the world. I've visited some of these plants. No, as your campus has shown, stop the plastic, that's the place to begin. And for the circular economy, shift to cooperation. Cooperation with nature, cooperation with community, cooperation between different parts of society. Part of the reason things have gone so wrong and our agrarian crisis is so deep and has become a 1% crisis is because we've built an extractive system where food that we could be eating, in Jharkhand you could be eating food grown in Jharkhand, but food comes from somewhere far away and these distances are getting longer and longer and longer. I've had to deal with wheat imports, the dumping of the GMO soya, when I started the Sarson Satyagraha, and right now, our cooperative dairies are having to deal with the RCEP trade, where there's an attempt to open up the market to dump subsidized dairy products, which would totally kill the amazing trillion rupee economy that is the legacy of Dr. Kurian. Just like any living system has to have membranes. A cell has membranes. Our skin has a membrane. Can you imagine if our body was open? We'd be open wounds. This membrane decides how we interact with the atmosphere. Trade decisions and trade barriers are membranes of the sovereignty of a country. And that is exactly what is assaulted when the so-called free trade agreements start to destroy domestic production. What is called free trade began again in this land. Actually, if you want to see everything that went wrong, all you have to see is British colonialism. Everything that went right, look at Dr. Kurian. <laughs> British colonialism, you know, they began with an East, with a treaty, it was called the Farooq Shir Farman. He was the decaying mogul of the time. They bribed a clerk in the mogul court. 50 rupees, I think. 50 rupees, they said, get a signature. Farooq Shir Farman was between Farooq Shir and the right honorable East India Company, saying East India Company won't be taxed. East India Company will be protected. East India Company will get markets. Local traders will be taxed. And that created the inequality and that created the takeover. The WTO agreement, who wrote the intellectual property? Monsanto. Who wrote the agriculture trade? Cargill. Who wrote the safety food, so food safety treaty? Nestle, Pepsi, Coke. Now they want an e-commerce agreement with no taxation on e-commerce for Amazon and Walmart. In fact, the Amazon uh, um, Jeff Bezos became the richest two years ago 
after the Diwali sales of this country. That's why the traders are now saying, prevent them from advertising for Diwali sales. But we wake up a bit after the event. Talking about the safety issue, you know, I still love the Amul Dahi. I love the Amul Lassi. It's still Lassi and Dahi. When I travel to America, I can't eat the Dahi. You put a spoonful in and it's got this string that comes with it. They put so much gelatin because of long distance transport. The nature of food is totally changed because it's now adapted to the transport and long distance shelf life rather than health, taste, quality. I want to give you just two examples of this. So the first genetically engineered product was something called a flavor saver tomato. They had removed the gene that allows the rotting to show. So it was a rotten tomato sitting on the shelf looking like it's very fresh. It's a bit like old women when they Botox. Yeah? I called it the Botox tomato. Now, this tomato was so rotten that it didn't fly, it didn't take off. The the latest in, I call this fake food. And what, do, what is fake food? It has ingredients that are not food and it doesn't match with the ecosystem that is our digestive system, the gut microbiome. A hundred trillion living organisms making good decisions about what's good food and bad food. The reason people are so sick is we've made our gut very sick. In America, the children have leaky gut they leaky guts. Every child has a food allergy. Food for them has become an object of fear. So the latest I found was a huge ad about cow-free dairy. And I would love to know what Dr. Korean would have thought about this one. Cow-free dairy. You put the DNA from the protein of a cow into a microorganism in the lab and you let the microorganism make that protein and then you somehow squash it together and add a few more fake things and put it in a nice cup. And these days people have such guilt complexes about the cow that this has become a new market. I I grew up with a mother whose first children were her cows and calves. We were the second ones. In fact, my research foundation, I started in her cow shed when she said, you can take the cow shed. Now that I can't keep cows. I am sure and I hope some of the students here will do a study of the difference in the treatment of a woman who is a member of one of the cooperatives Dr. Kurian started, the relationship of love and care she has with the cow. And compare this to the 5,000, 20,000, 30,000 factory farms in America. Those are the systems that are emitting methane. Our free range cows don't emit methane. A balanced diet doesn't emit methane. Now they've universalized factory farming and said all cows emit methane. And then they give you fake food. But look at another aspect of this. The competitive economy, the extractive economy creates competition. The com competitive economy has turned our relationship between cows and us into a competitive relationship. More grain is today fed to animals than to humans. Even in India, you, you know, hybrid maize is taking over everywhere. You see hybrid maize. We did a study, 75% of it is for animal feed. That's why the people are still hungry. 90% of the soya grown in the world is for biofuel. It's not a food system. Only 30% of the food that we eat comes from an industrial system, which is destroying the planet, causing climate change, creating the water crisis, desertification, and the biodiversity extinction. The rest comes from small farms. 
just like Dr. Kurian, built on the foundation of a woman with four cows, two cows, one buffalo, and created the biggest dairy economy of the world. He showed us we have to start thinking of bigness as the cooperative arrangement of many smalls. Not one giant of the 1%. One billionaire doesn't make a society. And a billionaire can ruin the planet. And the planet is so severely affected right now that we have to look at the alternatives. And the principles that I've dedicated my life to of, of a balanced relationship of love and respect between species, anthropocentrism is also a colonial construct that just decided that humans were superior to other species. You could objectify other species, you could manipulate them, you could exploit them, and you could eventually leave them disposable. Because from exploitation, the next step is severe manipulation and finally disposability. I don't know if you've been looking at the news or hearing the speeches of our current Minister of Animal Husbandry. They are now talking about female-only offspring of animals. Now, in, when I wrote my book, Staying Alive, at that time, I used to go to Punjab and I used to see these billboards for female feticide. Choose the sex of your child. We managed to make 35 million girls disappear in this country. And part of it was in areas where chemicals and me mechanization started to destroy work in agriculture. Now the women were disposable. And female feticide became a way to deal with this issue. What you are seeing now, instead of the dual purpose breeding that we have had, I was very happy in the drive from Ranchi to see at least a few small farmers with their little bullocks going to their field to plow. It would be imp important for some of you students to look at the e emissions of tractorization of this whole country. How much would be the increased carbon dioxide? How much would be the soil destruction? And how much would be the loss of fertility if you don't have the animals on the land? Haven't we done something strange with ourselves? That in the name of protecting the cow, we have abandoned all the cows. You go to the streets of any big city, there's stray cows. Everywhere there's stray cows. Because we made exchange and cooperation in the livestock economy illegal. Culturally, but even legally. And it was Chennai that stood up and said, no, this is a breeding festival, the Jalikatu, you know, and said, we will not allow it to be made illegal. The only part of the country that did not allow the destruction of its knowledge of breeding, of animal breeding, we are the land with the richest diversity of crops. We are land with the richest diversity of animals. Brazil is taking our animals, and we are destroying them. Canada has taken our chickpea and then exports it to us. We import yellow pea dal, which is a nothing dal, you know. It's not a pea. Normally pea is green pea or white pea. This yellow pea, people think it's chana. It's not chana. People think it's tur. It's not tur. It has a pathetic 7% protein when our dals have 35% protein. We are not growing our pulses. We are losing nitrogen in the soil because pulses are nitrogen fixing. We basically are at a moment where the careful, cooperative arrangements through which Dr. Kurian gave us the biggest dairy economy, that those are the footsteps we need to follow to get India out of the hunger trap, the malnutrition trap, the farmer suicides trap. I'm not sharing with you the figures of farmer suicides, but it's more than 320,000 till 2016 till they counted and made it public. That number, is, if it was a tribal conflict and that number was killed, we'd be outraged. According to the United Nations, a genocide is the harm, deliberate harm to a group of people. It didn't say ethnic group, it didn't say religious group. 
It could be vocational group. The farmers are a vocational group, are annadatas. By destroying their very lives. This is, you know, female feature science makes women expendable. Cow free milk makes the cow expendable. Farming without farmers is Monsanto's dream for the future. And I'll be very happy to leave you our most recent reports on, on where the the 1% which has given us the planetary damage, destroyed our food system, destroyed farmers' livelihoods, would now like to take us. Of course, the 1% knows they're destroying the world. They talk very frequently now that extinction is unavoidable. And therefore, escape is the only option. And just like the British colonizers escaped to our parts of the world then, out of the poverty of England, today after having destroyed this planet, there are people, including Jeff Bezos, working on trips to Mars, as if the amount they're spending on escaping to Mars, they gave back to the society from which they took. With an apology, we took too much. Let's heal the earth. Let's create cooperative societies. Let's create a cooperative way of thinking that we need each other in mutual interdependence. And that this interdependence makes each of us richer. When that bee comes to pollinate your food, it doesn't say, give me a royalty before I pollinate. She pollinates with full generosity. When the flower allows the bee to come and take the pollen. It doesn't try and extract. Both are giving, but both are richer by their giving. This is the cooperative economy. And I want to end with a lovely quote I found from Kumarappa, uh, who, as you might know, worked very closely with Gandhi and wrote a book called The Economy of Permanence. And I think what Dr. Kurian gave us is an economy of permanence. We have to defend it. We have to take it from dairy into other fields. Our work has shown we can feed two times India's population, that our farmers can earn 10 times more if fairness, cooperation, and justice was the relationship and not the 1% return. Let me give you Pepsi's data. So last year, farmers of UP committed suicide because for five rupees, they were selling a 20 kilo sack of potatoes. So I did a quick calculation. When you buy a 52 gram of potato chips for 20 rupees, how much goes to the farmer? 0 0.04 paisa. 19 rupees, 97, 96 paisa goes to Pepsi. That's the 1% economy. No wonder farmers are getting poorer. No matter, the rural areas are in deep distress. <clears throat> and it's not that the rest of society is benefiting because our sweet little kids chomping on a staple of Lay's chips are getting obese and getting diabetes by the time they're seven and eight years old. We can do better with cooperation. When we realize our cooperation with the earth and biodiversity can do all the functions. When farmers cooperate amongst each other, they get a new kind of power that Amul has shown us. When the eaters cooperate with the producers, we will create new economies. That's the kind of economies we are building in Navdanya. We don't call people who eat consumers because the word consumption was the word for TB in the Middle Ages. People die of consumption. The planet is dying of consumption. We are co-producers because when with consciousness we choose what we'll eat, what we'll wear, how we'll relate, we are shaping the world. We become co-producers. And as Kumarappa says, cooperation implies the elimination of competition and working in a kind of partnership resulting in advantages to all. Therefore, <coughs> there can be no exploitation in cooperation. And I would add that sustainability and justice both flow from cooperation. Therefore, there can be no cooperation between an exploiter on the one hand and his victim on the other. The extractive economies is what has given us the 1%.
the economy for all beings on earth, the economy for all people is an economy of cooperation. That is where Dr. Kurian will continue to show us the way each of you, privileged to be in this institution, should dedicate your life to that because that is where you will get satisfaction. That's where you'll get fulfillment. That's where you will leave your own legacy. Thank you.